Uh, hello, everyone. I just want to take a quick moment to welcome you. I'm Brian Wilson. I'm the executive director here. I want to welcome you to the Ensuedo Institute on behalf of our faculty director, Chris Berry, who's um, teaching in Barcelona right now. So he, I don't know if he's joined virtually or not, but um, say hello. Hope everyone can get a lunch um, and enjoy our ongoing colloquium series. If you do want to sign up for more talks, we encourage you to do so and happy to um, see you here when we have them. Um, there's also some folks online, so welcome online. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kavi Bala, who's going to introduce our speaker today. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. I'm Kavi Bala. Um, I am an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Um, and I let me give me a minute to introduce both Smriti as well as the broader project to just provide some background of why we are doing what we are doing. So I'm a mechanical engineer, and my focus is on transportation safety primarily, but I pretend that I do broader health impacts of transportation policy, but I am an engineer and I work amongst engineers. And we've had a long simmering interest in doing more work around bicycling. And by we, I mean me and my engineering colleagues. Um, but when we started engaging with it, it, it was pretty clear right up front, uh, as most of you are aware of, that it's not just a technical subject. And we thought that we should be forefronting social scientists. Um, and so we started asking ourselves what that would mean. We managed to scrape together a little bit of money. That money paid for a postdoc, Smriti. I'll explain more in a second. And also we got money from uh, the Kephart Center uh, for Global Health. So for a pilot project. Smriti is an anthropologist or with anthropological training. She works on childhood studies. And around the time we were doing this, she contacted one of our close collaborators or one of our colleagues, um, showing interest in this kind of work. And because we wanted the work to be led by somebody with serious social science training, we had Smriti join us. She was at the time finishing a PhD at Rutgers. Um, I should say engineers tend to be dense. I am dense. Um, and we look for uh, like uh, insights or rather um, profound insights. Um, and the hope was that Smithy would bring them to us. And, and I would say that I've, I've been looking for insights all my life. And Smithy has been the most effective person at explaining concepts to me that are not technical. Um, some of which we will hear about today, but this is hopefully a much longer journey for us. Um, it might at times seem like we have armies of people working. That's uh, Smithy will explain why it looks like that. But really, it's a pilot project getting us started for the first time on trying to understand how to increase bicycling, bicycling in low and middle income cities. And we are not quite done yet. So towards the end, it, it would be really good if we could have some time for discussion. And at that point, what we are looking for and be really helpful for us is if you can help us think about how to pull these ideas together. So your reactions at that point is going to be just enormously valuable to us. Um, so Smriti, please. Just add one thing, um, since you did ask that we save questions till the end, but we'll have plenty of time to um, answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for your, for your introduction. Thank you very much, Kavi, for that really uh, rich introduction to the project and my work. And um, I want to take a moment to thank um, Amy Giles and Heidi Lee for helping organizing this talk. And they've made the process really comfortable and amazing. Thank you. Um, and I'm grateful to the Mansueto Institute for giving me this opportunity to share this research with you. I will be describing an exploratory mixed method study on bicycling in four low and middle income country cities, Delhi and Chennai in India, Dhaka in Bangladesh, and Accra in Ghana, um, as Kavi mentioned earlier. This is a paper in progress. This is a project in progress. Um, we, and we in the project and I would immensely value your feedback, questions and comments at this stage and hope we can uh, kind of come to that at the end of the talk because uh, there'll be a lot of loops and conversations even within the talk. So uh, why bicycling? Bicycling is a low emission and active form of personal transportation 
with much to contribute to making of healthy cities, drawing from extensive evidence in transportation sectors in high income countries as Europe, the UK and the US, um, bicycling infrastructure is frequently proposed in sustainable mobility dialogues globally as a linchpin between human and environmental health and in reducing automobile use. Major agencies like uh, the World Bank and WHO have also been trying to promote bicycling infrastructure in low and middle income country cities for these reasons. However, in LMIC cities, despite strong advocacy and increasing infrastructure investments, planning for bicycling often relies on evidence from high income countries or on relatively limited knowledge regarding the current needs and experiences of bicyclists in these places. So transportation researchers and advocates for um, safe roads in LMICs, uh, such as this uh, guideline that you see here, have highlighted the need for bicycling design guidelines and data that attend to the unique and highly mixed road and road edge use patterns in their cities in LMICs. Further, anthropologists and activists working on bicycling remind us to consider the social and political context around the implementation of road design, the human infrastructure in anthropologist and bicycle activist Adonia Lugo's words. Our project's inspirations are aligned with anthropologist Jonathan Shapiro and Jaria's upcoming book and provocation to attend, to attend to who bicycles in the cities at the moment and what do bi people do with their bicycles rather than imagining these cities as not yet bicycle friendly or cyclist friendly until they have been fully rebuilt through road design guidelines. Our project uh, as, a, um, as a step in the direction at, um, it has at heart this question, how do we achieve large increases in bicycling in LMICs? We see our research as adding bricks to, uh, to the pathway to answer that question. We ask, what is the current state of bicycling in Delhi, Dhaka, Accra, and Chennai? That is who bikes and why doesn't bike and why? What can change the situation? We are aiming to explore and get a sense of the current state of bicycling and barriers to bicycle friendly uh, policies. Let us take a look at the four cities that I'm talking about. Delhi and Chennai in India, Dhaka in Bangladesh and Accra and Ghana are rapidly densifying and expanding cities with a high burden on people's health from transport related anthropogenic pollution. Um, that is road exhaust, um, vehicle exhaust, um, road traffic injuries, and non-communicable diseases, resonating with suggestions that urbanization itself is a determinant of health, in this case, possibly negatively. The burden of such negative health outcomes falls disproportionately on the urban poor and marginalized populations who are also less likely to have the power to influence or benefit from systemic causes. So bicycling, bicycling has been approached within research and policy literature in three key ways, or I'm going to use these as lenses to uh, look at our analysis through. First, as a source of uh, transportation equity and empowerment, this is the case, especially in LMICs, um, with an emphasis on bicycle access through subsidies and bicycle distribution programs for adolescent access to school or as a livelihood uh, source, you might have come across such programs. Um, second, as a, a sustainable form of mobility, in particular, a pathway to reduce on-road emissions. And third, regarding health, comfort, and safety for bicycling's physical activity benefits and bicyclist safety. So uh, bicycling infrastructure in the, th in the context, in the three countries, needs to account for these three lenses, um, transportation equity, sustainability, and health, while taking into account the currently predominantly non-elite bicyclist demographics and experience seriously so as to support their mode retention so that they don't feel the pressure to get out of cycling. Road infrastructures attentive to bicycling need to maximize their, uh, sorry, minimize their further marginalization led by global and elite nexus in urban planning and to attend to pathways to equitable health. I'm going to use these three as the dimensions along which to present the data. I'm fully cognizant that uh, these three are highly intertwined and interdependent categories. They are not at all separate and you'll see that in the data as well. Okay. 
I am very nervous with my training in ethnographic and grounded research, as Kavi described, to speak about such rich cross-disciplinary conversation. Um, this presentation is just one, one voice and a slice from the efforts and conversation between so many experts and researchers, some of whom are here today, either here or online. Um, a highly multidisciplinary team, as you can see. Uh, the people on the slide, so there is another slide of um, people who are a part of the team coming along. So people on this slide have contributed to the work across cities. Um, Dr. Kavi Bhalla conceptualized the project, drawing from his expertise in road safety research. He did so along with Dr. Rahul Goyal, who is a transportation um, engineer, and Dr. John Anjaria, who's an anthropologist, two scholars with rich and extensive experience studying bicycling in the high-income countries and low LMIC contexts. My participation in this project, as uh, Kavi explained, emerged as a result of this collaboration. I'm really grateful to that. We extensively discussed uh, the shared goals and based on available resources, schedules and expertise and research interests of the site PIs, um, Professor Zahidul Kayam, who's a health economist in Dhaka and Dr. Ernest Ajimang, who's a geographer in Accra and their respective teams at Brock University's James P. James P. Grant School of Public Health and University of Ghana's Department of Geography and Resource Development. Um, their respective teams' expertise uh, and interests played a role in this. The people on this slide, um, I'll men I mentioned again, participated in the conceptualization in this exchange of methodological and logistical notes across the sites. <clears throat> The, the team listed in this slide includes all the fantastic research assistants and students whose specific research projects and site-specific data collection activities contributed to the project. We were on the road in multiple cities. Uh, so wherever I, I uh, mention site in both the slides, um, they are basically sites where we physically were and were engaging with uh, each other and with the roads. So. Um, yeah, because of the exploratory qualitative methods, there was an enormous amount of reflection and grounded thinking with the cities that came from research assistants. All the photographs and images that I put on the slides, unless I cite otherwise, um, are by one of us in the team, these two slides. The project was funded by grants from Pathways to Equitable and Healthy Cities, funded by Wellcome Trust, and um, the, uh, the Kippard Center for Global Health at U Chicago. In this picture, uh, this is some of us who were able to join an in-person meeting. Um, it, this was for a mid-review project hybrid meeting that was conducted in Delhi last July. So you'll see some familiar faces there. Why did we need, need such a large multidisciplinary team working on this project? Our methodology was very field intensive, working through relatively um, a short span of time, right? Like, I'm part of this project for say two years and that's very less for this kind of grounded and expansive work. Um, so as Kavi described, this is also a pilot project to, um, and, and a brick to a pathway uh, further. So this mixed methods exploratory research project involved three key components customized by the city teams, uh, bicyclist intercept surveys, semi-structured interviews and field observations. Intercept surveys with bicyclists were conducted in the three cities in locations on arterial roads, 171 sites, um, uh, sorry, 171 surveys in Delhi. Uh, there's an error in that number. I'm sorry about that. 50 in Dhaka. Um, I'm primarily going to be talking about the 50 bicyclist intercept surveys uh, in this analysis, though we also conducted 50 non-bicyclist road user surveys adjacent to bicyclists and 232 uh, intercept surveys in Accra. As you can see the timeline, we were learning consecutively from the cities. Um, the intercept surveys were basically targeted surveys for uh, the specific group of bicycle users um, in these um, settings. Uh, basically intercept surveys in general are targeted surveys uh, to speak to people in the site where people conduct some kind of use um, for people who are unfamiliar with that methodology. Um, in, we particularly chose intercept surveys because they provide a targeted and less expensive alternative to conducting household surveys. Um, and how we did this, our team members waived to request passing adult cyclists on arterial roads to stop. 
uh, what we call arterial roads here uh, were quite literally arterial to the city's traffic flows, large roads with features like a median separating traffic, likely multiple lanes, uh, bus routes, and these were likely connecting peri-urban areas um, to city core. These uh, often have speed limits higher than 30 kilometers per, per hour, that's approximately 20 miles per hour, and um, these also likely we thought might benefit from uh, bicycle lanes or are thought of in, in conversations about safety that way. The surveys were conducted uh, in Hindi, Bangla, English, and Akan with languages whichever is local to the region. Um, the survey respondents were asked about their income, education, employment, cycle ownership status, migration status, and um, household status and bicycle uh, bicycling skills. The surveys were conducted in Delhi across seasons, but in the, you can see that in the months, but in the relatively shorter span of time in Dhaka and Accra, uh, minor changes to question contents and order were incorporated based on iterative feedback from the cities and to account for regional relevance. The survey sites were identified for having high, um, relatively higher bicycle presence um, through a combined consideration of street traffic counts in the case of Delhi field observations, regular transit experiences, and information received through interviews. We use semi-structured interviews in Delhi, um, Dhaka, and additionally in Chennai um, to explore bicycling experiences and politics in the, in the three cities. We interviewed stakeholders, including cyclists, bicycle repair shop owners, manufacturers, and officials. And what I'm calling field observations here were fluid and, and they were grounded in principles of ethnographic research. We covered different roads, junctions, gated communities, urban edge areas, key market areas, and in particular, bicycle markets. In Chennai, the focus was on children's bicycling, building on my own prior work with school children's life words in Tamil Nadu, the state where Chennai is located. We did targeted observations here, um, and uh, stakeholder interviews with adults in areas surrounding schools. However, all interactional research, surveys and interviews that I report here was conducted only with participants older than 18 years of age, the age of majority in these three countries. We analyzed the data using basic descriptive statistics from the surveys, thematic coding of the interview and observation data, and we um, triangulated across types of data and sites through lots of subjective discussions and analytic memo writing. So what did we observe? Here are some slices. Uh, bicyclists using large arterial roads in Delhi, Dhaka, and Accra were largely poor adult and male. This pattern in the data emerged from the likely the time and location of our surveys, except for one woman survey respondent in Dhaka who was a student and two women cyclists who declined to respond in Delhi. All the intercept survey respondents were men, predominantly um, young adults to middle-aged with primary to secondary level education, with a slightly older distribution in, in, in Delhi um, than in Dhaka and Accra. They were largely from low-income households with income ranges less than the average per capita income in the respective cities. And you can see that too. And you can see that over here, this is the city average and household income over there. We considered household vehicle ownership to signal socioeconomic class in the three regions where automobile ownership was considered sort of a pathway to class mobility. The respondents' households in the three cities predominantly owned only one bicycle, one or two bicycles at, uh, at, at max, and no other um, no other motorized vehicle. And you can see that wherever I list um, no motorized vehicle, that means mm -hmm. uh, the folks had only bicycles in their household. And this is in comparison with 19% um, in Delhi that we know that 19% of Delhi households own a car uh, from a recent survey. So this is quite stark compared to that. Um, in our interviews, in our interviews, we encountered an association between bicycling as something only the poor, the children, or very few sport enthusiast elites do. A shop owner referred to this specific type of cycle. Ah, I'm so sorry about that. This specific type of cycle you see here, 
a shop owner refer to this as labor class bicycle. I will talk about uh, this specific style of bicycle in a subsequent slide. As one of the interviewees, a bicycle repairer in Delhi said when Kavi asked him about the future of bicycle in the city, he said this. He said that bicycle will not, bicycling will not reduce in the country because poverty will not go away. The male survey respondents predominantly worked either in the informal sector, including vendors, daily wage labor, tailors, gardeners, and gig workers, or in the formal sector with salaried income, including as security guards, delivery workers, cleaners, salespersons, and technicians. And you can see the types of bicycle use that they um, are likely to describe in, in that table. Relatively rarer groups of bicyclist respondents, including five students, a librarian and a teacher amongst the respondents in Accra, two students in Dhaka, and one tuition teacher in Delhi. Um, this was a very small group in the survey responses. The nature of the employment that we see here suggested that their work, the survey respondents' work, included physical activity and was very unlikely to be sedentary in nature as we think about bicycling um, in high-income countries as an alternative to. Um, during our observations on arterial sites where surveys were conducted, the team members saw or met very few children on bicycles, either, um, either as the main riders or as pillion riders, uh, that is in the front or in the back of the bicycle. While women as pillion ride riders were much more common, especially in Delhi, the observed children were of adolescent age and male and were larger uh, in number in Accra compared to uh, Delhi and Dhaka. Now, this is all are mainly during the times and times that we observed. As I mentioned earlier, the time, days of the week, locations and seasons of our fieldwork shaped the data we collected. In particular, the gender skew of our survey data prompted us to conduct targeted scoping for pockets in Delhi and Chennai, where women bicyclists were likely to be present. And we knew that uh, from our prior exploratory research. When I speak of the, um, when I speak of gender here, um, we are working with how the interviewees and respondents presented themselves in terms of gender. And this is very limited and limited to the heteronormative binary in this case. Um, a lot more research is needed to see how gender works alongside bicycling in these sites. We located and conducted two semi-structured interviews with women cyclists in Delhi who worked as domestic help within a residential enclave. And the interview was conducted at the enclave's park where the women rested along with a group of three of their other, other colleagues who were sort of in and out during the conversation due to varying schedules. In Chennai, um, and, and lots of the pictures here are from Chennai. Um, apart from domestic help workers, we also spoke with women using bicycles um, to travel to work or to drop or pick their children up uh, from school. So children are on bicycles, but they are um, bicycles are being to being there to kind of take the load off the, the labor of walking on arterial roads. Both in Chennai and Delhi, they um, the people mentioned bicycling shorter distances. The women mentioned bicycling shorter distances of about like two kilometers with multiple stops for both work and for other reasons. Unlike the male survey respondents on arterial roads on the cities who reported a long single ride to the work location, even if they have multiple stops at their destination. Except for two women bicyclists in Chennai who were employed as non-teaching staff at a nearby school, the women's travel to work schedules in both cities um, were, also, were also later during the forenoon than the male survey respondents' early morning travel. And I put out like a rough schedule out there of how we saw bicyclists on the road. All this was predominantly during the work week in the respective countries, which aligned with our research team's uh, work week as well. More on equity. The migration status of bicyclists and their reports on where they had learned to bicycle was very insightful um, to think about equity. Multiple survey respondents uh, in Delhi mentioned that they were away from their families and stayed in the city for work. Um, echoing anthropologist Malni source research on bicyclists in Kolkata. Migration appeared to work on the gender of urban bicycling too. 
we encountered uh, instances both in Dhaka and Delhi that hinted at taboos uh, against women bicycling. However, such ideas varied quite a bit uh, by the locality and the migration status of the respondents. Women interviewees in Delhi described either having learned to bicycle uh, or having migrated from other states in India that have active bicycle distribution schemes for adolescent age young people, such as West Bengal. In Dhaka, we had a very interesting anecdote where a female bicyclist survey respondent um, and the uh, conversation is quoted here. The respondent is currently a higher education student. Um, this person described that moving to the city from her hometown and the anonymity of the city allowed her to learn to bicycle from her sister, younger sister, who kind of sneaked out in the village and learned to bicycle. A significant proportion of survey respondents and interviewees in all the three cities described learning to bicycle in locations other than the city, raising questions in our mind about how people in the city, especially children, learn to bicycle. Our observations <laughs> in uh, Delhi, Chennai, and Dhaka indicate that children largely cycled within traffic-restricted residential pockets, within buildings, even apartment terraces, and especially avoiding large arterial roads. Even the few whom we observed bicycling on arterial roads were often walking with their cycles to cross the road. Um, there was for sure a socioeconomic class difference in terms of which children got to bicycle within such enclaves and who had to take to roads. I'd like to move to the second lens here, environmental sustainability. It is well understood that bicycles are an environmental, environment friendly mode of mobility and leisure as they are largely human powered. Uh, they don't burn fossil fuels or cause air pollution through vehicle exhaust. So I'm going to turn to some other ways in which bicycles are sustainable in terms of how they use material resources and space during their life cycle. Many bicycles we saw were used for a very long time after their purchase. Um, for instance, see the age of the bicycles that we met on the streets. Um, and that's like we saw some 22, 23 year old secondhand bicycles. Like that means that, um, yeah, they were used for many years even before the person bought it. Um, over half of the bicycles that the survey respondents rode were secondhand bicycles. Uh, the respondents did not know how long the cycles have been used before purchase. The secondhand cycles on average were about a third of the cost of new bicycles, as you can see here uh, between these. Our field research observations indicate that some of the bicycles also included models, especially the bicycle frame, that were no longer being manufactured or uh, the companies have been closed down. In Chennai, we also ob observed several government distributed, government distributed bicycles that were usually given to school students circulating widely on the roads through a secondhand market, which means that young people have likely resold these bicycles. Bicycle users indicated that regular repair and maintenance contributed to the, to the cycle's longevity. Now, uh, Recall the labor class bicycles that I cited earlier, this one. I'm putting that in quotes. Um, some of the oldest bicycles that we encountered were these steel frame roadsters with rod actuated brakes, um, about 1.5 inch thick wheels of varying diameters. Um, this is sort of between a city bike and, a, and an MTB. And uh, it's usually fitted with a carrier to bear load. And you'll see that here. This was especially uh, the case. Uh, we saw a lot of steel roadsters, especially in Delhi. Uh, and these were variously described by interviewees as simple cycles by repairers in Delhi, Sada or ordinary cycles in Chennai, Busanga Volvo in Accra, that's similar to calling them labor class cycles, and Phoenix um, in Dhaka. So Phoenix also refers to some of the models, manufacturers. Um, these fixed gear, gear roadsters were largely associated with low socioeconomic status. These cycles were well recognized for their durability, longevity, and ease of access to parts and repair skills in the market. And these relatively heavy and robust bicycles are largely designed for slow movement, often carrying goods or a pillion rider. And you see uh, that going on here. 
robust cargo tricycles and uh, cycle rickshaws, uh, which are like three wheelers in Chennai, Delhi and Dhaka also use the same braking mechanism that is a rod, rod actuated steel brakes and, and similar build. Other bicycles we encountered included single gear step through frame cycles uh, like this one, um, like this was called the ladies cycle. And those had caliper brakes um, and uh, mountain bikes with fixed or multiple gears, referred to as ranger cycles in Delhi and Chennai or MTB in Dhaka and Accra. Retailers in all the three cities displayed um, a significant variety of such cycles, the, the MTBs uh, and the ranger cycles in the front of their shops. They had very few steel roadsters, these on display. Um, policy analysis uh, of the bicycle industry, such as by UNDP in, in India, reported that children's cycles and steel roadsters hold the largest market shares at the moment. Manufacturers are basically pushing for more types of cycles and e-bikes to grow and sustain the industry. Um, shop owners mentioned a peak in cycle sales during school vacations and claimed that stylistic choices governed the sale of uh, children's bicycles because they're fast moving. However, utility and longevity took priority with simple cycles, these cycles. Um, however, these supposedly simple cycles took on a variety of modifications constructed out of all kinds of reused and recycled um, upcycled materials that are highly customizable. This includes um, space for children to sit on the back um, and like, displays for the wares that the, the cycles are carrying. You can see that really colorful broom display going on with the simple cycle in Delhi. And all these are basically cleaning products. And this person is an ice vendor uh, in Dhaka who had uh, produced, used cycle tubes to um, bind and hold the, um, the, the, the vessel that this person had. And also cooking gas cylinders, which tend to be really, really heavy. Uh, hooks were used to hold, and you would see multiple, like two to three minimum uh, gas cylinders, uh, liquid petroleum gas cylinders being carried on these, um, these two wheelers, these cycles. So public bicycle sharing systems have been a thrust in places like Chicago. I'm sure some of you uh, have been commuting with those, especially to build last mile connectivity, right? These are very sparse in places like Delhi, Chennai, um, and Dhaka in terms of geographic spread and user base, and they are still in plans in Accra. However, the four cities bicycling culture um, has sustained a thriving secondhand market um, when I'm saying secondhand, that means multiple use markets. We encountered that bicycle repair and maintenance shops also serve as portals where people buy and sell cycles. While some of these interviewers, um, sorry, interviewees reminisced about using bicycle rentals in, in such shops, we found only two mentions of such rentals, one in Delhi and one in Chennai. And we also heard about a few in Accra. However, some respondents mentioned that they borrowed or uh, borrowed from their kin or acquaintances and lent bicycles quite a bit. One thing that drew our attention when speaking of uh, speaking with bicycle repair shops is the transitions and precarity that they face. So, um, repair shops we spoke with included anything between a retail setup with a go down. So this is, for instance, a retail uh, setup which has displayed lots of um, MTBs and children's bikes in the front. Uh, and we also spoke with uh, setup, uh, setups on footpaths with minimal tools, air pump, water, adhesive, scissors, a wooden plank or, or some bits of cardboard, uh, small spare parts and a box of tools to make adjustments. And this is sort of like a part of that setup. Um, such, repair, um, such a repair setup owner in a footpath in Delhi described that he regularly received chalans from police uh, as his shop was considered illegal. He said that he keeps setting up the shop after a few days again regularly as uh, he has a regular stream of customers coming in. A similar footpath shop owner in Chennai, whose uh, setup's picture this is, mentioned that he did not have a repair shop. Sorry, he did have a repair shop that got flooded during monsoon and he did not have the money to restore it. So his presence in this, on this footpath was negotiated with the local traffic police uh, by the residents in the neighborhood 
who sought to cater to their children's bicycles uh, repair. Such experiences of urban illegality and precarity of service providers who actively contribute to the sustainable mobility uh, cultures of the cities form, it, it kind of offers a powerful critique of the excessive emphasis on elite-led ideas of tactical urbanism in these cities. So, for instance, weekend road closures to support non-motorized transport, uh, which are usually negotiated by elite-led um, non-governmental organizations. The way bicycles occupy real estate space in these urban areas is also very, very sparse. A large fraction of our survey respondents mentioned that they park their cycles either within their homes or on a balcony or in their roof or just along the street. Very few had designated parking areas. And when I'm talking about parking areas, these are not, uh, these are a little bit unlike what you're used to seeing in places like Chicago. Um, You'll see cycles parked together, as you see in this picture, for instance. They are uh, standing on something called the center stand. Um, and these are very common within institutions such as schools, industrial sites, and along, or, or alongside railway stations, there are little paid parking spaces for two-wheelers. Um, in the cities we conducted interviews, Delhi, Chennai, and Dhaka, we could identify no specific vendors, associations, networks or lobbies through which bicycle repairers, retail or parking service providers connected with each other. So, I mean, a lot of these setups typically had displays like this to indicate that there was, uh, there was a shop. Like if you saw uh, a tire up there, you know that someone's out there to help. The adult male bicyclists who responded to our survey traveled bicycles to, from, and during work for very long distances and durations. Um, with particularly long commute times in Delhi, 40, 47 minutes average one way uh, per day. Interviewees noted that the travel times depended on a time of the day, often with longer commutes while dealing with traffic in the mornings. During our field observations, we noticed bicyclists navigated roads infrastructural features like these footover bridges, they're, they're winding footover bridges, as you can see the blue over there, um, or flyovers, uh, medians interrupted by U-turns, and that's, that's one of those medians, intersections, roundabouts, uh, which are designed to ease the movement of automobile traffic. These basically increased bicyclists' effort and travel duration, sometimes requiring them to consider necessary shortcuts, such as uh, moving counter flow to automobile traffic uh, on the main carriageway, or climbing median with their bicycles, um, or walking up a flyover, um, or riding along a slow-moving mo automobile like an auto rickshaw to gain momentum. The average, uh, the average travel duration amongst the survey respondents in the three cities, uh, especially in Delhi and Accra, um, was higher than WHO's current recommendation. So this is the current recommendation range that is 150 to 300 minutes per week. And what we see here is um, 564 minutes. Uh, and we like, took a six day work week. <laughs> we had a lot of people report seven day work weeks. So, 564 minutes in Delhi, 360, um, yeah, 373 in Dhaka, 493 in Accra. So that's like way here. And uh, a, a 2019 meta-analysis of the health benefits of physical activity dosage indicates that compared to a sedentary lifestyle or least activity, any increase in physical activity provides a dose-responsive reduction in all costs uh, and cardiovascular disease mortality. The current global guidance to adults aged 18 to 64, uh, and we didn't have people older than 64, by the way, in our responses. Um, 18 to 64 is uh, the recommendation is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. That's the green zone. Little evidence is available regarding the level at which physical activity benefits start diminishing or the presence of any risks uh, until 750 minutes a week, according to WHO, uh, and little to no additional gains uh, observed after 300. So basically, this part is, is like, yeah, if you wish, you could do kind of space. Uh, we speculate, however, that the overall physical activity of the respondents that we spoke with may be much higher than what uh, we measured. That puts them 
far in the blue zone in this area or higher. Bicycling is basically likely adding to their already physically labor intensive work. Um, while prior research accounts for the lack of risks and harms associated with physical activities, our research extends studies from LMICs that reveal the risks for uh, cycling for people engaging in it for livelihood. They are exposed to harsh weather and urban air pollution. Uh, for instance, we witnessed both a heat wave and flooding during our field work time. Um, and that was relatively a short span, right? For instance, um, and the lack of shade or well-drained pathways along the cycling routes on arterial roads meant that bicyclists we encountered were exposed to outdoor sun and flooding, bearing the long-term risks uh, ascribed to occupational exposure to these in LMICs. Such risks are apart from the well understood road safety risks faced by cyclists in mixed traffic due to lack of separated lanes or speed calming measures and the likely respiratory discomforts, if not risks of navigating poor air quality. So um, the respondents and interviewees in the three cities described traveling early during the day and late in the evening to avoid harsh sun. We did witness bicycles um, out during rain and, um, and sun in Delhi and Dhaka. People were using raincoats, handheld umbrellas, single-use uh, plastic bags as rain cover, including during days when some of the roads were flooded. Um, however, the cyclists' reflections uh, during interviews on, on their safety on the roads provided, provided striking insight into the marginal place of this mode of transportation on the roads of Delhi, Dhaka, and Chennai. Except for a few who did not reflect on the topic, almost all the interviewees placed the onus of safety of the bicyclists on their own behavior, on the bicyclists' own behavior, and on cautious riding. See this quote from uh, Dhaka, for instance. Uh, bicyclists took the actions of automobile users as a given, and basically a frustration that they needed to negotiate with. So if it's ridden, if the bicycle is ridden well, says this interviewee, no accidents will happen. If I drive like crazy, drive fast, then there will be an accident. In that case, there is no problem if I have my own control and that's it. So there is a sense in which um, the distribution of responsibility is squarely on the bicyclists in their imagination. The survey, in this survey, we did not ask about crash experiences, the, but the interviewees in the three cities uh, described crashes or accidents um, in quotes again, as a routine part of cyclist experiences. While none recounted major injuries to themselves, expenditures to repair cycles or um, damage of goods they carried was much more common. Parents in Chennai and cyclists in Dhaka, again, as you see in this quote, expressed a lot of concerns regarding children bicycling on roads, particularly alongside buses and truck traffic. A few stakeholders described scenarios where they actually perceived bicycles as more uncomfortable for their children than motorized two-wheelers, which we know is um, actually more risky. A grandmother in a low-income neighborhood in Chennai described her concerns about her grandson's excessive enthusiasm for cycling with his friends. This currently teenage grandson was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 10. And she was worried about his, his exposure to road injury risks. However, she mentioned that her grandson had recently transitioned into using a motorized two-wheeler for short distances, and he wore a helmet to ply goods for her from the market. Additionally, we observed that facilities like drinking water or toilets are hard to access on arterial roads, though a few interviewees, though very few interviewees mentioned such needs. Often uh, Roadside food stalls and repair spaces gave respite in this account. In Delhi, we saw um, this, uh, which was a volunteer maintained facility called Matka Man, basically earthen pots filled with water and a little bit of air pump, uh, as an air pump for filling uh, air on the bicycles. And in Chennai and Dhaka, also we saw a smaller um, voluntary shop front offerings like water, we saw cyclists proactively use these during our field observations, which was which was really important. Speaking of risks, on one hand, older interviewees 
discussed the traffic injury risks and physical dis uh, discomforts of bicycling as a reason why they would not encourage their young children to bicycle or why their adult children dissuaded elderly parents from bicycling, even when they perceived bicycling as a source of well-being. Interviews uh, describe such intergenerational conflicts and frustrations around bicycling in the process of caring for their close kin, occasionally leading them to take up uh, motorized two-wheelers. On the other hand, several interview respondents in Delhi, Chennai, and Dhaka reported a sense of well-being from the physical activity and autonomy that bicycles provided. One of the interviewees described bicycling as a habit that he might find difficult to return to if he started to use a motorcycle. And one e-bicycle user in Dhaka described taking up bicycling um, after a physician's advice. And lots of uh, bicycle retailers and um, repairers made claims about the physical and mental health benefits of cycles. It is really difficult to make any generalizing claims with such grounded data. Uh, just like there are concerns about uh, grafting high-income country street logics to low-income countries. Um, but here are some notes from our analysis regarding uh, bicycling and infrastructures. We see that equity, sustainability, and health are intimately intertwined in LMIC cities with very contextually situated tensions. There is an existing debate among cycling researchers. This takes different forms in places like US and in LMICs. Um, on one side, there is the infrastructural redesign, basically, especially segregated bicycle lanes to support non-motorized transport uh, is considered a high priority and that it will lead to increased bicycling. The pushback to the side within literature from the US and Canada is the argument that such lanes and separations and infrastructures lead to increased bicycling, but not necessarily diverse bicycling. In fact, it is a pathway to gentrification through increased real estate rates and doesn't, for instance, resolve forms of policing faced by marginalized communities who are on bicycles. In places like Mumbai, the, um, an LMIC city, also there is an argument that such lanes are pathways to gentrification. However, in such LMIC cities, where the road edge has a rich and bustling life, including vendors and service providers like the repair shop owners that I was talking about. The critique is the question um, John Anjaria asks, what does, what do cycle lanes replace? Sorry, this is, yeah, what do cycle lanes replace? Um, bicycle lanes and segregation here don't always lead to increased bicycling or improved uh, human infrastructures, but may in fact, disrupt existing non-motorized transport cultures and further marginalized non-elite marginalized non communities who are engaging currently in sustainable forms of transport. Um, he, um, so considering that large road and metro constructions are happening now in these countries, India, Bangladesh, and Ghana, it is not so much a question of design versus human infrastructure, but a need for simultaneous attention to both basically the interconnected realm of human built and policy infrastructures. The question is, can budgetary and road space allocations for automobile centric road features be accountable, not just to economic growth and speed, but also to existing sustainable mobility cultures amongst urban poor and not add strain to them. For instance, when a new city bypass road is built or medians are planned, are there ways to account for existing street cultures of bicycling in these locations instead of grafting on them? Um, can we imagine such forms of accountability to bicyclists as a pathway to transportation equity and health that can be sustained across generations especially, for instance, so that children don't feel pressured to move to automobiles? I will end with some questions for future research and policy that we were thinking about. So first, how do we encourage active transportation while optimizing the human effort and vulner vulnerability that bicyclists face? Secondly, how to keep the, bicycling, the bicycle market alive while nurturing the longevity and repair of bicyclists, bicycles that exist at the moment? Third, 
how do we support the need for smooth roads for convenient cycling while supporting the need to deter speeding motorized vehicles, especially motorized two-wheelers in the cases that we've been observing with new bicycle lanes? Um, and finally, uh, a methodological concern. How do we weight representativeness while working with a phenomenon as diffuse as bicycling in LMIC cities? For instance, who is the normal population? And what road types and aspects do we attend to from a bicycling planning, bicycle planning point of view? And what methodological innovations can aid this research? I would love to hear questions and uh, comments and discussions. And I have a pen ready. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was really struck by the, the data that you're seeing that there's real kind of social difference in, in bicycle use. Did, did you get a sense of the other, I guess, so it sounds like most people you interviewed were potentially lower socioeconomic status based on this data. Did you, did you get a sense of sort of more well to do people? Are they just not interested? Is it like a sort of aspiration for car ownership like do you have a sense of that side of things because it seems like you might you know that would be a population you have to focus on and maybe start moving the needle a little bit um, absolutely Brian so uh, we specifically focused on um, weekdays to be on the road to observe and speak with bicyclists who are doing this for um, livelihood reasons or on a regular basis. And um, the research by John Anjara and also Ad Adonia Lugo in the US indicates how the, int the interest towards leisure bicycling as, as much more um, common and spreading thing is way recent than these people who are bicycling for a very long time. So in some sense, um, these are two different so, um, bicycle mobility cultures that are using the same shared space and have a lot of potential to build alliances. And in fact, alliances do happen. For instance, um, there are bicycle used bicycle uh, distribution and circulation that happens um, through pathways that um, elite bicyclists create. Um, we saw that happen in Chennai. We, we saw that happen in Delhi. Uh, and lots of awareness rides and promotion of bicycling and um, activism around it. So um, I don't know if I'm addressing or answering your question. We did speak to uh, bicyclists who who had more recently come back to cycling with lots of memories and nostalgia about having bicycled as children and also critically thinking about their positions as cyclists on the roads and trying to build alliances. But um, during our field observations, this was a very, very small group and this would largely happen um, not really when motorized traffic was going around. And there is also uh, a group of people who are encouraging people commuting using bicycles. Um, again, questions for future research and we hope to address that. It's like there's a online. I love this, by the way, yay. <laughs> um, question for your future research, are you looking at changing the geographies to kind of take into account different climates? Um, so of course, Chicagoans, we think of, well, yeah, we'll ride our bike in the summertime. <laughs> um, and even those who kind of use it for getting to work, and I get these are folks that are using it for their livelihood. Um, is there any thought about doing it in colder climates to see how that impacts folks who use um, the cycles for their livelihood in addition to commuting? Um, thank you very much for that question, uh, Tiffany. Um, so when I say these people are using it for livelihood, a lot of people are actually commuting to work. They're going to factories, industrial sites, they're going to schools uh, or their workplaces. And um, yeah, so two parts to this question. Uh, one is the, the ongoing shifts and changes to who is bicycling and who's commuting to work using bicycles in these cities um, is something I think we'll have to probably observe uh, going forward. Um, and uh, thank you for that provocation. I think it will be great lead think about going forward. Um, regarding different climates, um, that's a really important question, not just about climate, but also terrain. 
we've been thinking a lot about uh, e-bikes in particular and how they can potentially participate in this equation uh, or a spectrum of two wheelers uh, between bicycles and uh, heavy motorized two wheelers and lighter motorized two wheelers in between um, and how uh, e-bikes can provide sort of um, uh, an easier transition into bicycling for people, especially living in terrains uh, like another city, uh, for instance, Bangalore, uh, which is uh, which is less flat than some of the cities that I've described. Uh, so yeah, we, we are thinking about these questions going forward. And uh, I think uh, the provocation about climates gives a, uh, I would love to hear suggestions about how to Think about that. Kavi, would you like to add about that? Thank you for your question, Tiffany. I don't know if I addressed that. <clears throat> Another question. Um, about one of the things that are ubiquitous in places like Delhi, right, are auto rickshaws. I wonder how, or have you thought about how the kind of, I don't know if you call it auto rickshaw culture or how, how like, is that a place you think policy-wise they could shift, help shift away from this, potentially moving away from motorized, you know, autos or I, I don't know if that's something you guys have thought about. I mean, you know if that would work, if that makes sense economically or feasibly for some of these people. But... Do you think it might work yeah. policy interpretation? Something where like, instead of, um, you know, I these are I, I don't know the licensing for for autos, but um, do you, like if you could ship them more to you know manually powered, you see them a lot in cities now. Again, that's compared to another not uh, to like you see them in downtown Chicago, for instance. But they, there does seem to be potential to to do something like that. You know, ship licensing to license more or to provide some kind of economic benefits for less gas powered vehicles. That's a that's a really interesting question, and um, but please tell me if I understood this correct. The kind of um, three wheelers that we see in yeah. downtown Chicago are uh, they have pedals and they also have a motor. Uh, but what we call an auto rickshaw in the in in say places like um, Delhi and Chennai and uh, um, and a CNG in Dhaka is actually a full blown motor vehicle. And has speed limits much higher, or uh, speed capacity is much higher than um, um, a cycle rickshaw. And what we see here uh, in Chicago, somewhere between the two, I would say, uh, am I accurate in describing that, Kavi? There is a. They seem to be more sort of, I mean, the ones I've seen in Chicago, they seem to be more kind of recreational fun. Yeah. You know, they're not really like the event <clears throat> market for public transportation, let's say. So what's really interesting in the case of uh, Dhaka is that, um, in, in my limited understanding, uh, cycle rickshaws are licensed vehicles, but cycles are considered um, personal use vehicles. So there are, there are actually statistics about how many cycle rickshaws are there in each zones and um, the kind of risks they face. And there are zones where cycle rickshaws are prohibited because they are considered slow moving and uh, obstruction to traffic. Uh, or automobile uh, flow. And what I found really interesting is that in places like Chicago or even in the thrust around e-bikes, the ad, the fact that you're adding a motor to some of these cycle rickshaws is considered a feature, right? But adding motor to cycle rickshaws is considered a bug in the case of uh, regulations in Dhaka. So someone who is adding a motor to uh, the cycle rickshaw is basically rigging it. So uh, they need to be regulated. So they, um, when we were uh, on field observations, people would actually uh, like not show the uh, motor or have it under the vehicle. And there are some uh, parts of Dhaka where it's highly regulated. And you see, you'll see cycle rickshaws more in the older parts of the city and less regulated there where the lanes are narrower and more winding. Um, so the question of, Three wheelers at large and three wheelers that move. I'm, I'm saying three wheelers also because that includes um, cycle rickshaws, which carry passengers, but also uh, lagunas or like rickshaws uh, that have three wheels and are pedaled 
which are slightly larger or um, different vehicles. Um, in, in Delhi's case, you'll see a lot of those carrying, um, used to carry um, household municipal waste around. Those present a complex uh, question that we have not really engaged with very deeply in our research and both spatially and as in space in terms of how much space they take up and also the kind of space that they occupy within the city. Um, we saw them a lot in neighborhoods and uh, there seems to be discomfort in their entering arterial roads, which is again really interesting. Uh, and this is also coming alongside the idea that bicycles have to be on the edge of the road and not enter, take up space, right? Uh, I don't know if I responded or yeah, answered that question, just, but something. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a, it's a different um, mode of transportation. We don't like say have in the US, right? So it's, it's, I haven't thought about how just how they yeah so we did but it's, it does have to be complex. Yeah, and and I think there is research. There has been and continues to be research on on that question. I think we have time, right? Yeah, just maybe, maybe I'll talk to you about this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> another question. I just want to kind of think about your methodological question about like you know, your choice to stop people who are actively bicycling. And if, if part of the goal is to understand the barriers to bicycling, you're probably not catching them because you're talking only to people who have chosen to bike. To bike. Um, and so I was thinking about, um, you know, people who come from the same origin point as the bicyclers, but who are choosing to take vehicular transportation. Um, and if it's like, those people would maybe be more able to speak to why they choose not to bike. Um, so that was one, one piece, and I wondered, I know we're a little bit out of time, just one would get one, I guess. Um, and then the other was, given that your findings are that biking is adding a huge amount of labor to already hard laboring people, is the push, I mean, obviously there's an environmental benefit to pushing towards bicycling, but like, is there a... Uh, potential to almost exacerbate inequality by um, trying to promote bicycling if it's mostly going to be taken up by sort of low income laborers, um, which I think is just like an interesting tension in your research. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are just two <clears throat> comments, not exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, and Shush, did you have a question? It was actually pretty related. It was kind of like it, it brings me thinking, like, should bicycling, especially along major roads, be promoted at all mm -hmm. um, if it is quite dangerous and the population doing it are kind of forced to economically that that yeah that that might not be like maybe pushing bicycling for these um, safer parts of the city women doing shopping is like where to put your energy and and it's you're not trying to I don't know, yeah, promote on these dangerous highways. This tension that you're pointing is really like central to what we were and have been thinking. Do we have the time? Is it okay if I respond to these two questions together? And then, yeah. Um, so, okay. So the question of uh, why people choose to bike is, is really complex one and very unique to each um, context. And uh, John Anjaria's prior work uh, and a, a lot of other conversations that we had and um, reports from other cities also indicate that this idea that some people are captive bicyclists or like they, they have no other choice uh, is not 100% uh, not accurate. It's, it's a little more complicated than that because people do feel that bicycling gives them a sense of well-being. And they do feel a sense of autonomy in doing that. And when we spoke to bicyclists, there was also uh, notes in some of the interviews that the women in their household don't bicycle in some of the households. And saying that out loud was also establishing who has, in some sense, autonomy to move around and work and earn and who has a relatively limited um, mobility, um, like mobility possibilities. Um, so... I think our, uh, the reason why I pointed this out, uh, this, uh, this, the tension that are we adding labor by promoting bicycles? I want to deflect a little bit from the question to ask a different one. Are we making it harder for people who are currently bicycling by centering a lot of the arterial loads designs and uh, focus on, on automobiles? 
So to take away bicycles from the people who are currently doing it or choosing to do it, um, who basically come to the city and decide this is an economical option for them because cycles are so inexpensive and they can build a livelihood around that. Uh, what would it mean to, to actually add strain to that possibility while securing um, or like making sure that automobiles flow without obstruction? Mm -hmm. So I think asking the question slightly differently just mm -hmm. like changes how we're thinking about the problem. And um, yeah, that's a really central tension as we were pointing out. So with whom are we promoting bicycles and how? Or, or what are we facilitating becomes uh, the bigger question, I think, here. Uh, and uh, I, I, the methodological point that you've uh, shared is, I think, central also. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we are trying to um, also do interviews at the same time and also do some mm -hmm. non-bicyclist um, surveys in Dhaka. We are thinking about how to do similar um, origin um, interviews and surveys to see how people are choosing different uh, vehicles. And these are all in the works. And thank you so much for thinking about that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, did you ask your respondents about theft? Because I understand theft is increasingly an issue in even high income cities. Because I understand that now in Amsterdam, people do have to lock up their bikes. So, how about for like the low income locales, like middle low income locales that you survey? Um, uh, absolutely. So we uh, theft was one of the probes that we had for the interviews, which means that we didn't explicitly ask uh, or necessarily the questions about it. But if they come up, we would ask more questions about theft. Um, so these were conversational interviews. Um, and a few people did mention concerns about uh, their bike getting stolen or, or like having had to repair or buy another bike. But what was interesting is that all of them locked their bicycles and they had padlocks. Um, by padlocks, I mean like robust locks that are fitted into the bicycles, not external to the cycle, uh, that are um, that can lock the bicycles in place wherever they are. And in places like uh, Dhaka and Delhi, cycles were also tied up to trees, to poles on the road, and locked with these uh, amenities that are around in the environment. Uh, so yeah, these locks were giving us um, the idea that theft was, was something the cyclists were likely definitely thinking about um, and working around. But the kind of um, bicycle theft that we see in, in Chicago, where parts of it are removed, that I don't think we saw so much in the cities, where you'll see the frame remain almost skeletally and then uh, parts remain. So there are lots of people who are usually watching over the bicycles when they're left out, because these are road edges with stalls and vendors and people going by. Thank you. I think we can Thank you. Uh, wrap up the motion. You don't have a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone online, and thank you all for being here. So, so thank you. Really enriching conversation.